Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janice Searles Jones, the CEO of Ocean Conservancy, and I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to join us for this important discussion. The midterm elections are over, and even the hardest races to call have mostly been finalized, but the impacts that the election will have on our political landscape are still unfolding and will continue to do so over the coming months. At Ocean Conservancy, we've been closely following not only who the winners and losers are on election night and in the unfolding days, but also who will serve in key leadership positions in relevant committees and Congress as a whole, as well as issues and trends that are emerging and how that might drive the dynamic starting early next year. On our webinar today, we're delighted to have two veteran ocean experts to give you an in-depth look on what the next Congress will look like and what that will mean for ocean policy. I'd like to welcome Addie Hoy, Associate Director of Ocean Conservancy's Government Relations Team, and Rob Zucker, Partner at Winning Strategies Washington. First, Adam Missler, our National Outreach Manager, will get us started with a few logistics. Good afternoon, everyone, at least for those of us on the West Coast. Good morning. <laughs> East Coast, good morning to those on the West. Thank you all again for joining us. I want to let Addie and Rob get right into the nitty gritty. Um, so I'll save most of the logistics until the Q&A section. And I hope you have some great questions saved up, but a few things up front. I know a lot of you would like to dive into Winning Strategies Washington's preview of the 116th Congress, and that memo is attached to today's webinar. If you're using GoToMeeting on your desktop, oh, sorry for the, sorry for the issues here. We, we will be restarting the, the PowerPoint right now. Um, so if you're using GoToMeeting on your desktop, it can be the memo can be found under Handouts tab, and it will open in a new browser window. If you're using the GoToMeeting app, it can be found by pressing the Document Looking Like icon in the upper right-hand side of your phone screen. Uh, we will also be emailing the memo to attendees after today's webinar. If you dialed in for audio, you will need to enter your unique audio PIN to later participate in the Q&A. That pin can be found in the audio tab of the GoToMeeting desktop menu. Thank you very much, and thank you, Rob and Addie. Rob? Uh, thank you very much. We're very much looking forward to conducting uh, this presentation today. Uh, Addie and I are going to switch off as we present more information about the House and the Senate, and I'm going to let Addie lead on the overview. Yeah, hi everybody, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we see a lot of familiar names uh, on the attendee list. It's really exciting to all be coming together to have this important discussion at this important time. So a few things we're gonna cover today. Um, importantly, starting on January 3rd in this new Congress, Democrats will have control of the House of Representatives for the first time in eight years. Uh, for those of you paying attention uh, in early November, this happened in an exceptional way with Democrats gaining 40 seats in the House, which is more than any election since Watergate, uh, since right after Watergate in 1974. So we'll talk in detail about what that means uh, for the Democratic leadership in the House uh, and House of Representatives. Some things to be looking out for are certainly oversight of the Trump administration um, and the fact that we will have a, a, a significant Democratic majority backstop when it comes to legislation uh, potentially passing, passing Congress. Um, it, on the Senate side, uh, things uh, sort of let fewer changes to discuss, but we'll go over them with you. Um, Republicans will keep their majority and actually grew it by a couple of seats, but even so, we know that especially in the Senate, bipartisanship is needed to, to pass most bills. Um, we're going to talk through some of the key changes in committees, which is where a lot of the action is, is moving right now. You're probably seeing those headlines all the time. Um, and important changes in place like Senate and committees like Senate Commerce will really impact us in the ocean community. And finally, Rob is going to talk us through a few of the broader sort of political landscape issues. Um, there are going to be some different some differences between the 115th and 116th Congresses, and uh, we're going to talk about what those are going to be. So I will let Rob uh, take it from here and talk us through sort of where the biggest changes are, I think, post-election, which is in the House of Representatives. Thanks very much, Addie. I'm going to be presenting just a little bit on the House Democratic leadership changes, as well as some of the key changes within the committees um, and what we can anticipate starting uh, uh, in the 116th Congress that's sworn in on January 3rd. Um, as Addie mentioned, um, biggest gain for Democrats uh, powering themselves to control of the House uh, for the first time uh, in several years, 
uh, as importantly, um, we will see an end to the two-year period of same-party control, the White House, House, and Senate. Um, I think Addy referred to it as a backstop. I think a great way of understanding that is, uh, for people on the call today is that this gives a much greater chance to stop bad things from becoming law. Um, there may be limits, however, on the number of good things that can actually be made into law in the same period of time, because anybody trying to get a good bill, even if they can do so successfully through the House of Representatives, is going to face uh, a Republican Senate, let alone the present veto pen. I think it's interesting to understand that uh, Democrats powered to their majority through really large-scale wins in coastal states, such as California, New Jersey, New York, Florida, and even Texas. Uh, I think that that may have interesting implications for the policies that we see the House of Representatives pursue or the oversight that they're going to conduct in the 116th Congress. Also on the strength and the margin of a 40-seat victory, uh, we are seeing Democrats return and reward the top uh, members of their leadership heading into 116th Congress. A fair amount of ink has been spilled, and I'm sure a lot of you have read it, on uh, maybe the back and forth uh, about uh, the future of Speaker uh, Pelosi or the potential Speaker Pelosi. I think uh, she has taken the moves in recent days and overall to solidify her role as currently Speaker designate. She really won an overwhelming vote in the Democratic caucus's leadership elections that span November 28 and 29. And in recent days, through certain concessions uh, that we feel are going to be announced formally on a limit to the additional number of terms that she might serve as Speaker, I think personally that she has, uh, she's, she's banked it. I think that Speaker uh, uh, Congressman Pelosi will be the Speaker when all is said and done on January 3rd. Um, other members of the re Democratic leadership that will be returning, uh, Congressman Stan Hoyer of Maryland, a coastal state, will be moving up to become Majority Leader. Uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn of South Carolina, another coastal state, will move up to be Majority Whip. They're going to be joined by Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, a new entrant, so a little bit of that generational change that people have been talking about in Democratic circles. We will see him uh, come on as caucus chair. Um, at the same time as we are going to have one of those people who is involved in the takeover, uh, Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico, rewarded with the assistant Democratic leader post. Uh, uh, additional members of that generational change are Congresswoman Catherine Clark, who will uh, enter leadership, as well as Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of Western Illinois, who is going to become the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee chair. I'd also just note that um, although it's a diverse array of people um, that will be serving, uh, two of the five, two of the top five will be uh, represented from the Congressional Black Caucus. And one way to think about the incoming uh, dynamic within Democrats is that uh, the Congressional Black Caucus is going to have a very influential block uh, heading into next year. Um, we've listed in bullet form some of the other positions, so I'm not going to talk all the way through them. And instead, uh, I'm going to turn things over just to a brief review of the House Republican leadership. Um, we've known since April 2018 that there was going to be a transition in the leadership among House Republicans uh, when Speaker Paul Ryan announced that he would be retiring from Congress. The only question is, uh, and among those Republicans, would they be serving in the Speaker role or would they be serving in the minority? Ultimately, with the loss of the majority, um, it was kind of a snoozer. Um, there was really less drama than I think anticipated. There was uh, Kevin McCarthy of California um, successfully won uh, the role of minority leader. He was challenged uh, probably symbolically as much as anything else by one of the stalwarts in the House Freedom Caucus, the most conservative block of members within the Republican conference, but defeated Jim Jordan by a vote of 159 to 43. Congressman Steve Scalise of Louisiana moves up one rung as he ran in uncontested for minority whip. And we will see one of those new faces among uh, Republicans and the only member of the top leadership that's a woman among Republicans with Liz Cheney of Wyoming becoming a conference chair as Kathy McMorris Rogers stepped down from that post. I would simply note that as part of this takeover among Democrats, a lot of uh, of the more moderate Republicans either did not seek re-election or were defeated in their effort for re-election. Members like Carlos Cabello, Bruce Poliquin up in Maine, or Congresswoman Ileana Rose Leighton were all involved in some of those efforts to recognize the challenge of climate change or respond to it or other aspects of ocean policy. And um, it's going to be sad to see them go in that sense. Um, also, I think I would just underscore 
that overall the House Republican conference tilts further to the right ideologically, becomes more conservative, and it may be even harder to find individual members to work across the aisle with because I do think it's been a hallmark of both Ocean Conservancies and the Ocean Communities outreach efforts to try to work on both sides of the aisle. Um, again, we have a little more detail on the individual members of the Republican conference's leadership in our memo. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Abby to take, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm gonna continue on with uh, a look at the House uh, committee leadership. Um, on, uh, first and foremost, I wanna look at the Appropriations Committee, uh, arguably the most powerful panel in the House of Representatives, where Nita Lowy historically is going to become the first chairwoman of the House Appropriations Committee. I think even more historically, she, her counterpart in that role uh, as ranking member will be Rep. Kay Granger. So we're gonna have the first uh, female uh, chair as well as the first woman ranking member. Um, interestingly, they, the two have worked in that role on a subcommittee together on the State Foreign Ops Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, both as ranking and chair. They switched off that role over different years. They have a great personal report but before I go too far about the great personal report, I would just note that obviously Congresswoman Kay Granger is going to need to represent the views of her conference in that role. And as much as they may get along, there's going to be a fair amount of butting of heads as well as they work through these issues on spending bills. Um, I would simply also note at the top line that with Democrats running the House of Representatives, we can anticipate um, broadly uh, at a top line level um, them to propose higher spending among domestic uh, spending and less on defense or national security spending. That's historically the tension between those large pots of dollars as we head into various budget years. Um, obviously, uh, anything they, any work they do is going to have to be a compromise with, again, the Senate controlled uh, by Republicans. On um, the key subcommittees, Congressman Jose Serrano of New York is set to take the gavel at the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Subcommittee. He's always been a good ally to work with, and we anticipate more productive work heading into next year. Congresswoman Betty McCollum is poised to be the chair of the Interior Environment Appropriations Subcommittee. Um, we also look forward to continuing to work closely with members like Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, as well as Congressman Derek Kilmer, who've been great advocates and proponents of a robust NOAA budget. I would also simply flag for people that with the change in the majority to Democrats, the ratios on various committees will change. There will likely be at, you know, seven to eight new Democrats assigned to the Appropriations Committee and we'll need to get to know them early. Um, again, I already mentioned that Congressman, with the retirement of Congressman Freeland Hezen, we have a new incoming uh, ranking member. There was defeat uh, of the Commerce Justice Science Subcommittee Chair, John Culberson. We do not know who will fill that role yet. Um, the decisions on the Republican side for subcommittee leadership will likely be happen within January 2019. Moving on to the Natural Resources Committee, Congressman Raul Grijalva of Arizona is set to become the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. And on the Republican side, Congressman Rob Bishop will shift into the ranking member role. Um, we also understand that Chairman Grijalva, as part of his new chairmanship, is inclined to shift around the jurisdiction among the subcommittees. So it's very possible that we are going to see a shift in which committee oversees ocean policy, fisheries policy, and there's the chance that it means that the current uh, top Democrat, Congressman Jared Huffman, will no longer chair the subcommittee that may oversee these policies next year. Nevertheless, Congressman Huffman, Congressman Alan Lowenthal of California, people that, we, that the ocean community broadly and Ocean Conservancy has worked with very closely will continue their role as strong voices for robust ocean conservation policies in the next Congress. Um, with, uh, let's call it a target rich environment for oversight, uh, House Natural Resources Committee Chairman uh, Grijalva is going to examine uh, the rollback of things like the National Monuments. He has already committed that he wants to do a lot more on the investigation work and the way the Interior Department has conducted its work. And right at the top of that list, um, is the, the, the efforts of uh, Secretary Zinke uh, himself. He's publicly called for Secretary Zinke uh, to step down following internal investigations over the Interior Department. Many of you have seen the fireworks already between those two members. And um, other than popping the popcorn, I think that we'll be looking at a very robust oversight uh, uh, agenda for that panel heading into next year. Um, I would just say that the ocean community broadly is looking a little bit more how Foreign Affairs Committee, given uh, the changes and the interaction with Arctic policy and how those intersect with all you know, sorts of aspects of ocean policy, 
I just want to note that Congressman Elliot Engel of New York is set to be the new chair. He will have a new counterpart, a new top Republican uh, in, the, uh, in Mike McCall of Texas, who shifts over from previously being the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. I um, want to note that Peter DeFazio will be the new chairman at the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Um, uh, uh, and he will uh, have Sam Graves be his counterpart with uh, the retirement of Bill Schuster. They will be uh, possibly tackling a large infrastructure package that we'd want to track con over energy and commerce. Frank Pallone from a coastal state in New Jersey is the incoming chairman, uh, and he has pledged to have a very active oversight agenda uh, as part of his uh, work. Congressman Greg Walden will shift over to being the ranking member there. Um, and then just mention that at the Science, Space, and Technology uh, Committee, um, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas uh, will be taking the gavel. She will, we will have a new person on the top Republican over there as uh, Congressman Lamar Smith is retired. Congressman Frank Lucas will be the ranking member. And just flag for folks that Ocean Caucus uh, co-chair Susan Bodomici of Oregon stands to become the chair of the Environment Subcommittee. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Abby to take a look at the Senate. Great, thanks, Rob. Um, so over on the Senate side, uh, we mentioned earlier there's a little bit less change than we're seeing in the House. But that said, there are some key changes we want to note. Um, Republican on the Republican side, the, they have term limits for their leadership positions, which means importantly for us that Senator John Thune will take over the majority whip position. That's sort of the number two position to the returning majority leader, Mitch McConnell. That's important because uh, you can't hold the whip, that whip position and a, a, a committee chairmanship. So Thune will have to step down as the chairman of the Commerce Committee. So we'll talk about that uh, when we get it. We'll get into some details there when we talk about committees, but that's an, an important change uh, in leadership that's impacting us in the ocean community. Um, on the Democratic side, um, despite losses on Election Day, the Democratic leadership in the Senate will pretty much stay the same. Um, the political landscape for Democrats was very difficult going into this election. So there really aren't, you know, there's not a lot of punishment being doled out to leadership for the fact that they didn't win. In fact, losing uh, the two seats that they lost uh, was not even close to a worst case scenario for Democrats in the Senate. So they'll have 47 seats. They'll still have a filibuster power. Obviously, that's not doesn't apply to every piece of legislation, but is incredibly powerful. Often means that bipartisanship, bipartisan support is required for legislation to move in the Senate. So, um, on the committee uh, structure in the Senate, we will have um, the same key senators returning in the Appropriations Committee: uh, Senator Shelby and Senator Leahy uh, at the at the top of the full committee leadership, and we'll have um, Senator Moran from Kansas and Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire in the in the, the CJS subcommittee. You know, the NOAA budget did quite well with these four senators in charge in this current Congress. And we are hopeful and confident that the stability, the stability of staff, uh, the stability of, of having these same members involved, uh, these same senators involved moving forward will be a good thing for ocean funding. Um, I already mentioned the shakeup in the Com Senate Commerce Committee. With Thune's move into leadership, we will now have Senator Wicker become the chairman here. Um, the Commerce Department has jurisdiction over just about everything NOAA and Coast Guard, so this is an important change to track. Uh, Wicker is from Mississippi. It could make a significant difference for us to have a coastal senator leading the, the committee, so we'll be watching that closely. Um, in addition, uh, you may have seen that Senator Bill Nelson lost his reelection bid to Governor Rick Scott, who will take over his Senate seat. With that, um, a new Democrat, Senator Maria Cantwell, will take the ranking member spot on the Commerce Committee. And um, as many of you know, Senator Cantwell has extensive experience working with our community on a whole range of ocean issues. Um, so I think we're in a good position as a community to work with her on that committee moving forward. We are still waiting to hear uh, subcommittee uh, assignments there, so we aren't sure yet if Senators Sullivan and Baldwin will keep their spots. Uh, as leading uh, the Ocean Subcommittee, but that's something to stay tuned for in the coming month or so. Uh, I'll just say a, a quick word on environment and public works. This is an important committee for any infrastructure package that could be developed, um, which may implicate climate change and coastal issues and things like that. Um, I'll just mention that the leadership there will remain the same. So energy and natural resources, this is where our happiness over Senator Cantwell leading the Commerce Committee Democrats hits a bit of a hiccup. With her move over to Commerce, Cantwell opens up the ranking member spot here on ENR. 
Um, and the next highest ranking Democrat eligible for that spot is Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. So he will be taking over and we'll be watching this one really closely. Senator Manchin has a history of challenging climate change science. He has a history of supporting fossil fuel development. Um, but that said, he has publicly stated um, as he's coming into this new role, his commitment to work with environmentalists and others um, on the committee. So we will be looking to hopefully work with him to educate him on ocean issues and find a, as much common ground as we can. Um, also on ENR, Alaskan Senator Murkowski will stay in the chairman's role, and she's already talking about uh, wanting to hold hearings on climate change. Uh, she is uh, a, a believer and uh, feels very strongly that, uh, you, you know, her state, Alaska, is suffering uh, some of the effects of climate change and therefore will be an interesting um, senator for us to work with on that committee. And one last committee just to mention because of the impact on ocean policy is the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We'll have a new chairman there in Republican Jim Risch of Idaho. Um, moving along here out of some of those nitty gritty specifics, we want to uh, take just a quick moment to show you some of the new faces of Congress. Uh, there's going to be a lot of new members, a lot more than these, just these five, and there's more listed in the memo um, that you can download or that you'll receive via email after, after the webinar. Um, but just to identify five sort of new House members to watch that we really think um, have the potential to become champions for ocean issues. I'll start with Joe Cunningham uh, of South Carolina. Uh, incoming Congressman Cunningham is an ocean engineer by training. He uh, has op is opposed to offshore drilling and seismic testing and has called it too risky for the South Carolina economy and ecology. Michael Waltz uh, of Florida, a Republican, is a former Green Beret and counterterrorism advisor from the George W. Bush administration. His time there has led him to a position that the warming earth is really impacting our national security and poses a national security threat which I think is a really important perspective uh, that he will bring to the Republican caucus this upcoming Congress. Debbie Mukarsel Powell uh, has worked for a series of nonprofit organizations, uh, including on coral issues. Her district is down in the Florida Keys. Ed Case uh, previously served in Congress uh, prior to 2007. And he's, uh, when he was deciding to run and return to Congress after a, a, some time away, um, specifically cited climate change as a key issue that he wants to work on. Elaine Luria in Virginia represents all the naval bases and, and, and uh, military installations in the Virginia Beach, Norfolk area. Um, and, you know, she is coming in at a time when there is a desperate need for those um, areas to undertake extensive planning to prepare for sea level rise and climate change. And it's uh, an interesting addition to have a Navy veteran uh, in such a critical congressional district for the military uh, coming in at, at this time. And I'll also say a quick word um, before we move into the Q&A. Um, you'll see in the memo, uh, but I know last year, I think when we, or excuse me, last election when we talked about some of these things, we talked a lot about the new Ocean Caucus leadership and changes that were happening there. No change uh, this time around in the Ocean Caucus leadership in both the House and the Senate. We'll have Senator Whitehouse and Senator Murkowski leading the Senate Ocean Caucus. Congresswoman Bonamici and Congressman Young leading the House Oceans Caucus. So stability there should, I think, be a good thing for our community. Adam? Oh, Rob, sorry. We're passing it back to Rob to talk about some of these key issues. Thanks. Thank you. I just, I, I, I know we've walked through a lot of information and a lot of the specifics. Um, I thought that I would just uh, discuss a few more overarching issues that aren't specific to the ocean community but are worth keeping an eye on. Uh, as we head into next year. The first among them is uh, the discussion in the House of Representatives uh, among Democrats to create a new select committee on ch climate change. Some people are calling it a select committee on a green new deal. And uh, it's something that uh, some of the newly elected progressive members among Democrats are pushing for. It's something that uh, some of the more progressive stakeholder groups have been pushing really aggressively on. Um, I would tell you that uh, that uh, there's been some pushback on it from some of those uh, leaders at the committees which already have jurisdiction over aspects of what such a select committee would look at. Those include from the leaders at Energy and Commerce, Natural Resources, Oversight and Government Reform, where people like Congressman Pallone, Congressman Cummings over Oversight and Government Reform, uh, Congressman Grijalva all say that they're, they're, they're ready to go with robust oversight and to come up with great solutions here. Um, I think that it looks like in recent days, 
there's a middle ground uh, that is likely to be carved out where we see such a panel created, but not invested with the authority to originate any legislation. So that would mean it would be a great platform for talking about um, policies, including those that we care about as the ocean community. Um, so I think that looking at it that way, uh, we should be really excited to get in and educate and uh, uh, the members that participate there and hopefully shape some of the agenda that they choose to talk about. Uh, another thing I think that's worth discussing briefly is the likely return of earmarks in the 116th Congress. Um, as some of you may know, until 2010, members of Congress and the Senate had the ability to write into legislation uh, specific line items of funding for individual uh, jurisdictions like a county or a state, let alone individual nonprofit organizations, uh, uh, to receive money, federal dollars, to be able to undertake certain activities. Some of the time that was job training. Some of the time that might have been uh, environmental education. Um, uh, the Democratic leadership in the House has said they intend to bring these back after a moratorium was put in place when Republicans took control of the House in 2010. Uh, it just may open up some new opportunities for people working really more at the grassroots level and at the ground level uh, to create partnerships with the federal government uh, on areas of mutual interest. Finally, I wanted to flag some changes in the rules of the House of Representatives that, uh, that the Democratic leadership appears to have agreed to, in particular those working with the Problem Solvers Caucus um, as, uh, as Congresswoman Pelosi was negotiating to get uh, to lock down as many votes as possible for her speakership. Um, briefly, I think, and overall, uh, it's important to think of these as changes that would allow measures um, that have broad bipartisan agreement or acro uh, agreement across the aisle uh, to get their day in court, so to speak, in the House of Representatives. Specifically, that means that one of the things that was agreed to is a change in the rules so that bills that have at least co-sponsorship of 290 uh, members of the House would be considered within 25 legislative days of meeting that milestone, uh, that there would be a preference in the House Rules Committee, which determines which not only which bills come to the floor, but what is the what is the shape of debate, um, what amendments are made in order, that there would be a preference for amendments that have at least 20 members from each party co-sponsoring a given amendment. And then finally, that uh, that that a majority of members on a committee would be able to prompt a markup in committee on legislation that they have co-sponsored. Um, I would think of these tools uh, as uh, like fire. It can be used for good and it can be used, it can be harmful in the wrong hands. Um, I only say that because while I think that the general intent of these uh, rules changes is to be able to move, uh, move decisions and bills to the center, um, there's also the chance that maybe nefariously a uh, Republican conference that's unified could pick off a small slice of members on the Democratic side and potentially let uh, uh, give some bills that could uh, be of concern also get their day on the floor of the House of Representatives. It will be in our interest to continue to work in a bipartisan fashion across a broad coalition of members uh, to be able to make sure that this ultimately is a beneficial thing rather than anything detrimental to the issues we care about. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam, who will be able to uh, coordinate the question and answer portion of today's discussion. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, a reminder that if you dialed in for audio, you will need to enter your audio pin to join. That can be found in the audio tab of the GoToMeeting desktop menu. Everyone at the moment is muted. To indicate that you'd like to be unmuted so that you can ask your question, please, quote unquote, raise your hand by clicking or tapping the hand in either the desktop program or app. If you're using the app after I unmute you, you may have to tap the mic icon to unmute yourself. You can type in your question into the questions tab or by tapping the question mark in the app. This is not our preferred method for you to ask a question, but I will try and keep tabs and read aloud any questions submitted this way. Uh, as you all prepare your questions, I'm going to turn it over to our own Theo Kabowski manager of our ocean network to uh, start us off. Hi, yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you guys so much for sharing your insight. I know there's a lot to process <laughs> and there's still a lot to process, but it's so, so helpful to be able to just actually kind of talk through it all like this. So thank you both. Um, something that I'm curious about is, you know, a lot of this talk about what's new and what's coming in January in 2019. 
There's still a lot happening right now, yes. uh, especially around the NOAA budget, which is of course part of the part of the package of bills that is still being negotiated sure. um, in terms of funding. So I'm I'm curious if uh, any of these changes that you guys talked about, what is what does that mean for what's happening right now? Sure. Um, th this is Addie. I'll I'll take a first whack at that one. Um, yes. <laughs> Short answer. Uh, well, we're seeing um, a little bit of a breakdown in the negotiations uh, around the sort of end of year spending deadlines. Um, they, Congress has used continuing resolutions a couple of times to keep funding uh, about half the government where they haven't passed final appropriations budget bills for the year yet, which includes NOAA, it includes the Interior Department, includes EPA, um, and those agencies are now looking at a December 21 deadline, so that's like next Friday, I guess, um, a December 21 deadline uh, for something to be passed or else they could face a partial shutdown. And I, I do think that there are at least some election dynamics and new Congress dynamics at play. Some of you may have seen there was a very heated meeting at the White House uh, between um, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Donald Trump on Tuesday uh, that I think has led many people to uh, to sort of pontificate that a shutdown is more likely um, because of disagreements over immigration funding and funding for a wall along the border, U.S. border with Mexico. Um, that said, you know I do think that the NOAA budget uh, in the CJS bill is pretty cooked um, and ready to be served whenever Congress is willing to vote for it. Um, and so I think I continue to have hope that a lot of this is sort of grandstanding and positioning ahead of um, changes in the next Congress. And, uh, you know, that that may mean that we could see a CJS bill with a NOAA budget in it uh, pass sometime in the next week before that deadline on the 21st. However, <laughs> uh, I will say that here at Ocean Conservancy, at least, we are keenly aware of the possibility of a shutdown and are already keeping an eye on what some of the impacts could be at NOAA. Um, where when we've seen government shutdowns in the past that have impacted NOAA, you know, significant number of, st of staff are, are furloughed uh, and, you know, don't come to work and you can't contact them um, while, they're, while they're gone. And so stay tuned. Uh, you know, if we do get closer to uh, the risk of a shutdown late next week, we'll probably start talking more about what some of the risks are and what the impacts could be of that. Um, great. Great. Uh, and we have a question from Stephanie Balenson. Committee, he, committee leadership changes sometimes bring staff changes. Have you heard anything yet about staff, particularly on appropriations or Senate commerce? Hey, Stephanie, how you doing? Thanks for the question. Um, great to have you guys on. Uh, I, I, know, I don't know um, on appropriations or commerce that people are um, talking publicly about that yet. I would say on the appropriations side, you know, we had a longtime uh, NOAA budget staffer, Cola Rathburn, who departed the committee uh, earlier this calendar year, uh, replaced by Matt Womble, a former Sea Grant fellow. Um, so that was a, sort of a change that we had, um, you know, sort of already happened earlier this year. With that, I, I don't know that I'm anticipating any additional staff changes there. Um, so, so nothing additional to report. Um, and for those of you who haven't met Matt, he's wonderful and hopefully um, so going into FY20, many of you can connect, who maybe previously worked with Colo can, can connect with him. Um, on the, uh, on the co Commerce Committee side, I think is more complicated, right? We've got a lot of new leadership coming in there. We still don't know what the subcommittee situation is that hasn't been finalized. Um, so I think we all wait to hear more about that. If I may? Yeah. I would just elaborate just one little bit. I think it's very typical for uh, an incoming uh, an incoming chair or an incoming Demo uh, Democratic ranking member to bring some of their own staff along. Uh, particularly, uh, I would imagine that Senator Cantwell uh, may bring some people along from energy and natural resources, given that she will have her own uh, similar staff budget over at Commerce. So um, it may not be surprising. That's typical and that's generic advice rather than anything specific to decisions sure. that have been made. Sure. Uh, we have a hand raised by Mike Gravitz. Mike, I am unmuting you now. Mike? Restoration Institute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great. Um, so the question is, since um, 
Roger Wicker will be taking over, it looks like will take over the chairmanship of the Senate Commerce Committee. What, what have his traditional interests in oceans been other than, you know, fisheries in the Gulf? That's sort of what I'm familiar with. Sure. Has he, has he sort of talked about or submitted any other, any other kinds of bills that, that are ocean related? He has, yeah, I think, um, and hi, Mike, how are you? Um, the, there have been um, a number of, of initiatives that Senator Wicker has been involved in on the Commerce Committee. I know he's partnered um, with Senator Schatz on uh, in, like autonomous underwater vehicles and other sort of te technology pieces. He's incredibly fond of the, of the academic institutions in his state, uh, which do have, you know, significant uh, ocean and, you know, tech and research and science. I think um, he's also, uh, you know, obviously has a strong coastal zone management program uh, in the state, and they've been involved also in the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill disaster recovery. Uh, and so that, while is not currently sort of being legislated, I think speaks to his experience with um, environmental restoration and with NERDA and some of those other key uh, key issues that have been going on there, very much in a coastal and ocean context and very much with lots of NOAA engagement. Um, so, uh, you know, he's almost always had a Sea Grant Fellow uh, in, in his office, which I think is a, um, a, you know, an interesting note as to how seriously they take their coastal and fisheries and ocean issues that that that, that office is consistently sort of putting their name in to, to uh, get a Sea Grant Fellow. Um, and I'm sh I'm sure there's other examples other than that than one of you know those are just the ones that are coming to mind. Sure, so I think, yeah, they've had a pretty extensive a pretty extensive engagement on a lot of issues beyond just fisheries. And didn't Cola Rathburn come out of that office yeah. as a Sea Grant person? Yeah. That's correct. And, and so they do those Sea Grant fellows traditionally. I mean, are there any others besides Cola sort of going to say lying around? But I mean, sort of um, engaged in other areas of either the House or the Senate that you're aware of? Yeah, I think that's the case both for some of the Sea Grant Fellows as well as just for, for staff. I think that, you know, Senator Wicker has had both Sea Grant Fellows as well as regular staffers that have been really engaged that are still uh, still around. So thank can you. I make a point, can I make a related point maybe just to comment? Um, maybe this is just super obvious, but with the very large uh, turnover and new members, um, there are people that you might have been advocating with over many years and engaged on their staff that uh, will be shifting offices. Uh, not all of those pieces have fallen into place yet, but I am sure that as not only a matter of getting to know the new members and their staffs, um, you will see some of the people that you might have dealt with over the years on a personal office basis uh, move on to other places. So it'll be a great time to renew and refresh who you are working with at a given member. Yeah, that's right. And now we have a question from Matt Gove. How does the oversight theme of the new house affect ocean issues? Will they be too busy with oversight to work on our issues? Hey, Matt. Um, I think maybe, maybe there we will see. You know, if the house were to, for example, try to move impeachment or something like that, I do think that that would um, take up all the air in the room and really be something that would be a focus for the country, let alone for Congress. Um, for, for some time, but that said, so much of the oversight happens at the committee level. So in some of the committees that we talked about earlier, House Natural Resources, um, you know, and, and sort of some of the, whether there's a select committee on climate change or something like that, I think those committees will have plenty of space to focus on, on um, environmental issues, climate change issues, and our issues. In fact, we've already heard from House Natural Resources staff, you know, that they're sort of getting their thoughts together on what they would want uh, some some of, some oversight hearings uh, to look like in the coming year. So I definitely think at the committee level, yes. Um, at the full Congress level, you know, and at the full, you know, House level, I think we're going to have to wait to see um, what uh, Congresswoman Pelosi prioritizes and, and what she tries to move first. And, you know, it's very possible that climate change could be on that list. And, and, you know, that would maybe elevate, actually, some of our issues. Um, I would just note that uh, uh, Speaker Designate Pelosi has asked the head of every incoming panel for both a top oversight priority and a top legislative priority. They very seriously want to show, through their ability to move bills that set policy, 
what it means to have a Democratic majority in the House as well. So I think on this, they are going to be able to walk and chew gum. You will see plenty of oversight, but you are also going to see um, a concerted effort to show what it means from a policy perspective that Democrats are now in control of the House. Great, and our next question is from Philip Scanlon. What is the list of top ocean crises that need to be addressed by next Congress hmm. and by what committees? It's a good question. I think, um, I mean, you know, it, I think we tend to do okay in the ocean community on the key reauthorizations that need to happen. Um, obviously, for those of you who maybe cross over into working on things like flood insurance, you've seen, um, you know, these extreme challenges in getting reauthorizations of, of, of key programs done. We've done a little better on our end, I think, of making sure that some of the key programs at NOAA uh, that need to be reauthorized do get reauthorized. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't think we have any, you know, major issues like that. I think. Um, I'm not a, a fisheries or a Magnuson expert, but I know that, um, you know, things have really come down to the wire in this Congress on that. And so we'll really be looking to see uh, what some of the key players on both sides of the aisle are doing on MSA early in the new Congress to see what that could mean uh, for the, you know, for the full extent. Um, and, you know, beyond that, I, I'm hoping that we just really have an opportunity to circle back on talking about climate change and talking about sea level rise and focusing on some of the key ocean issues that have really, um, you know, sort of been been backseat, frankly, in the last couple of years and that we haven't really been able to address. So I think we certainly see those as crises um, that need to be re have really hard looks at what what additional resources need to be brought to the table. So it could be an appropriations as well as what authorizations might be needed to really um, take this take the next steps and take it to the next level. You know, some of you have probably heard, you know, the Senate Oceans Caucus is circling around what their priorities are going to be uh, in, in the next Congress. They're certainly interested in things like ocean data and, you know, how we're going to uh, really advance the, the important work that's going on. So hopefully that answers the, the question, but um, yeah. And next we have uh, Rennie Myers, who is actually an incoming Knauss Fellow for House Transportation and Infrastructure. Great. Uh, do you anticipate, anticipate, excuse me, the potential infrastructure bill to have significant clauses requiring resilient infrastructure or adaptation measures? Uh, well, I guess nobody knows, but <laughs> but I think I think that is certainly the ambition of a number of members that are working really heavily on that issue. That's right, Rob. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's very fair to say. I think that's the kind of um, that's the kind of issue that you might be able to see easy agreement on between the two parties um, heading into any consideration of a package. I think that there may be needed. Uh, you you may see the need to dance around certain terms. You know, we know that the president has, uh, uh, you know, basically denied that <laughs> we can tie human activity to climate change. So I don't know that you will see like words like climate change show up in these bills, lest they provoke the ire. But I do think we would see all sorts of common sense solutions so that infrastructure is done in a way that's resilient, can withstand, um, can withstand what are just becoming more uh, more damaging emergency situations like hurricanes or other kinds of storms. So I think that's something that they will try to factor in. And um, although it sounds like if you're a fellow over at one of the panels that will be working on this, uh, you know that the, a much bigger and more formidable issue to tackle is a funding mechanism uh, to pay for these kind of large scale investments more so than these kind of policy questions, I think, that will end up uh, less contentious. Great. And we also have a question from Katie Morgan, and she asks that you you talked about new members, uh, especially like exciting potential ocean champions. What's a good way to uh, get to know these offices? How how can the community best go about that? Sure, I mean you know shoe leather is the best answer I think in terms of getting up on the hill early and trying to meet some of these folks early on. You know, the, these members of Congress, these new elect, newly elected members of Congress, they've already been to Washington. They were here for orientation. They were here voting for leadership. Um, many of them already have at least one sort of transition staffer. Um, those staffers are working. They have emails at house.gov, and, you know, you can try to track those down as well. 
um, to be in touch with folks now. Um, I think the reality is that it takes a little bit longer, um, you know, to get to, I mean, it's, there's going to be a sort of a lot happening in January. We're going to learn what committees some of these new new members are on, and our list may really um, certain names may really pop out on our list of new members that we're interested in as they join House Natural Resources or other key committees. And so that's something we'll be watching. And in addition to that, it's going to take them a little while to hire. You know, most often I think our community is dealing with um, you know legislative assistance, uh, le sort of legislative assistant level staff. The folks that specialize and focus in you know energy and environment issues those are probably not going to be the first hires for these for these folks they're going to want chiefs of staff and they're going to be they'll probably hire a scheduler long before they'll hire an environment and energy uh, la and in addition to that as i'm sure uh rennie knows the uh sea grant fellows won't start till february so that's another thing to keep an eye out for um Rob? if i may um I actually think we, 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 we have some younger members of Congress. They're not yet of a generation that's what I guess some people call digital native. But I think actually uh, there's going to be a few different ways of thinking of engaging this freshman class that offer great opportunities. Um, many of them, not all, but many of them, uh, their election to Congress is their first elected office that they've ever held. So um, they will be getting to know the rules and procedures um, in fact, some advocates may have more familiarity with some of those rules procedures, even if you are not steeped in them every day. However, I think that one thing that seemed to typify this election cycle is a tremendous emphasis on the role of social media, whether organizing at the grassroots level or in the way that members found uh, of connecting with potential voters. And I know that the ocean community in recent years has really put a lot of effort into creating digital tools for advocates and uh, to finding more sophisticated ways of interacting with um, elected officials through social media. I think that's a great opportunity um, that we have before us just in general. And I 100% I agree with the emphasis on shoe level leather. There is nothing like walking into an office and seeing someone across from the table from, the table from you and interacting with them face to face, but I'm I'm really excited about what this, uh, the opportunities are here. And Katie had a quick follow up. How do people go about tracking down the emails so that they can uh, set up those meetings? It's hard to do I, for, for for right now for members in transition, but there should be phone numbers available for offices immediately following the beginning of the new the beginning of the new Congress, and so you know. Some people have fancy subscriptions to all kinds of online services that allow you to locate those emails. Honestly, usually the most up-to-date thing to do is to call the front desk of the office mm -hmm. and ask them who on their team is handling ocean issues and um, you know, sort of get firsthand who, who the person is that you should be in touch with. That's always uh, a, a go-to way to do it. Uh, and do we have uh, any more questions? I think we've reached the end of questions, so... Uh, Great. Give people a few moments, but thank you all. Uh, thank you all for your questions, and thank you all for joining us. Um, please email me. My information is up on the screen. I can get you in touch with Addy and Rob and anybody else here at Ocean Conservancy. Uh, if I if I can't answer your question myself, uh, I can help you uh, potentially uh, get in touch with offices or uh, be here at Ocean Conservancy can. And uh, we also have uh, ongoing efforts such as this webinar uh, with, our, with our ocean network to help people engage. And I, I hope that you uh, might engage with us. Thanks, Adam. So thank, thank you, you so all much. again. Yeah, bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Happy holidays.